So, Salaamu Alaikum. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, this looks impressive for me. So, I've been doing a lot of talks for conferences, for meetings, but when it comes to this number of students, it feels different. I don't know why, but maybe because one day I wanted to be a doctor and that I was not that successful in my academic life. So, that's how close I can get to it. So, uh, my name is Gharib Saad. I work as a senior security researcher for Kaspersky Labs. Before we start with my presentation, let me tell you what, why we are here today. Uh, as we said, I'm from Kaspersky Lab. It's Kaspersky, not Kaspersky, because it's named after the guy who has created the company, Eugene Kaspersky. And in Kaspersky, we believe that everyone who is using internet or technology have the right to use it in a free and a private way without facing any threats or being afraid of any type of attacks. And we have been fighting for 20 years to do this. But we also believe that we cannot do it alone. We need everyone to join our fight against cybercrime. We need governments, we need society, we need you to help us to fight cybercriminals. That's why we are here today, to ask you to help us, to make you more ready for cyber attacks and to fight cybercriminals. So, the clicker is not. Sorry for this, but it looks like Flickr also is not working. Yeah. So the guys from the event asked me to talk a little bit before the presentation about what a cybersecurity researcher is doing. What is your daily work, how you live, what it's like to be working for our R&D in a big vendor. So actually, as you know, for everything you are doing, there is different perspective how people see what you are doing. Mainly five perspective. And to be honest and frankly, I will be speaking with you today about the five perspective. The most important thing is how your mother sings what you are doing. So actually, I'm working from home. That means I don't go to office. I have set up my own lab at home, doing work from there. And you are students. You know the law that says it doesn't matter how much you study and you work hard. When your parents get into your room, you'll be playing. And that's exactly what is happening with me. So you always hear these words. Are they paying you to play computer games? That's your future, your unit, all these words, you know? <laughs> the other point is your friends. So actually, as a security researcher, you need to travel a lot for conferences, for meetings, uh, for workshops to help VIP customers when they got attacks, for doing incident handling. And I don't know why, but all the conferences for security is always hosted in Las Vegas, Caribbean, Cancun, Mexico. Tenerife, I don't know why, but that's where we are traveling. So for my friends, when I'm telling them I'm going for a business trip or for a meeting, they can only think about one thing. Me on the beach or on a party for nightlife, that, that's what we think I'm doing. So, who here is doing computer stuff, information technology? So you guess what? Like, what your relative thinks you can do is So, installing Windows, Windows installing expert. So, but what we are really doing seriously is we are working hard. We work day and night to analyze and investigate attacks, reverse engineering them, understand how they work. We spend a lot of time looking into screens, trying to understand things that look like this. So, yeah, life is not that easy for a security researcher. You work hard, but actually it's very interesting. It's very, it's very pleasure to be working as a security researcher. So, actually that's my team. The man in the middle here is Eugene Kaspersky and there's my managers. What we are planning for, we work for Kaspersky Lab. In Kaspersky we have one third of our employees are doing R&D stuff. That's around 1,200 employees. That's a very big number compared to others. And from those numbers we have the top team for the R&T and we call them the global research and analysis team. That's where I'm working and that's what I'm doing. My colleagues are around 45 members distributed all over the world. We have different experience, different expertise. We do different stuff. Some of us is doing network forensic stuff. Some of us is doing vulnerability research. What I'm doing personally is what we call malware analysis and threat intelligence investigation. So whenever we know about a new attack, I'm the one who is analyzing the attack and the one who is responsible to find who was behind this attack. Understand who was the attacker, 
what was their goals, what were their motivations, how they were able to hack into an organization or to attack a government. So, I have been part of awareness campaigns and awareness sessions, and actually, I don't always think it's very successful. The point is that we usually start and we always focus on how to be secure, what you need to do to be secure. Like, don't visit malicious websites, don't install softwares from unknown sources, but I don't think that's the right way to do it. I think we need first to start by creating the need for security, by making people and you understand why we need security, why security is important for us. So what I'll be doing in my presentation today is I'll try to make you afraid. I'll try to tell you what are the threats we are facing. So I'd like always to say with this thing, I work for an antivirus company and one of the most interesting stuff I get is numbers we get from our virus labs. Virus labs are the guys who is working 24 by seven to provide protections from malwares and from attacks. And the numbers are very interesting. When Kaspersky Lab started in 1994, we were detecting one new virus every second. A couple of years later, we were doing one new virus every minute. And then when we were doing one new virus every second. Now we are doing more than 350,000 new virus every day. That's a very big number. But actually the problem is not only with the numbers. It is with the type of malware we are detecting. While in the old days, Okay, while in the old days, that was the type of malware we were getting. The goal and the motivation for writing a malware was just to make fun or to be famous or to say that I'm a clever guy, I'm good with information, technology, I can write a program that is dist disturbing how your computer works. While the names for the virus were scary, like Ebola, Chernobyl, all these scary names, but at the end, the damage was not that big. But this, now, these days, the motivation is completely different. I don't know why the clicker doesn't like me, but okay. So the motivation for cybercrime and cyber attack is completely different. Now we see three different motivations for creating a cybercrime. The first thing is cybercrime, money. Then we have espionage, governments espionaging over another government, trying to steal information. And then we have sabotage, terrorist group or government trying to create a sabotage and damage to another government. So let's try to understand more how it works and what are the threats. So what are the main reasons for someone to make a cyber crime or to create a malware? As we said, money. Money is mainly the main motivation for everyone to make money, to become rich. And in cyber crime, it's very, very interesting for them. You can easily create money and you can easily infect the user without even moving from your place. And guess what? It's very hard even to get caught. In cybercrime, it's not that easy to find who was behind an attack. And even if you found who was attacker and where he is from, it's very difficult to get him caught because, as you know, internet and technology is borderless. So you might be attacking a government or someone in Bahrain while you are sitting in China. And then even if you know the person, it's very hard to go and try to suit him and get him caught. So, as we said, the main motivation for cybercrime is money. But there is a big misunderstanding here. Money is not only money, as we say. Money is not only from your bank account. Money could be everything, and that's a big problem, especially here in the Middle East. People think that if you tell someone that you need to be secure, you need to look after your security, you need to install an antivirus, he will tell you, why would I need it? I don't do online banking, I don't use my credit cards, so it's okay, let them infect my computer, they will not get anything. But actually, that's not true. If you think about it, do you think like stealing $100 from your bank account is more important, or for example, getting your private pictures, your family pictures. What looks more important for you? Do you think if someone could get access to your social account and start posting stuff on your behalf that will look bad for you and for your friends, what, what looks better? So we have made a study. One of the things we are doing is that we are monitoring the underground. We are seeing what the cyber criminals is doing with the stuff they are stealing. And we came out with the value of everything. Like we can say that 
if someone can steal your password, a copy of your password, it will be equal to $25. He can make use of it for $25. He can create a fake identity and use it for, to register on some website, to order some stuff using your identity. Your Skype can be sold for $25. There's different things. There is your gaming accounts. All this stuff means money. So money is not only from banks. <clears throat> so even when it comes to bank, how can a cyber criminal stole money from your bank? So now it's becoming very, very popular and very trending to use online banking. You log into your bank to check your bank accounts, your bank information. You can make transfers from your bank account to another account. You can pay pills. You can recharge your mobile phone. You can do a lot of stuff. And it's becoming very trending. So for cyber criminals, if they can get access to your credentials you're using to log into your bank account, that means they can make money. So that one of the most popular intrusions we have been seeing these days is what we call banking intrusions. These are type of malwares that will infect your machine and they will start waiting for you to get access to your online banks. And then when you start typing your username and password, they will do what we call key logging. So they will be listening to the keys you are typing and they will be saving it and using it to get access to your account and steal your money. That's one way. But, but as we said, cyber criminals are very clever and they work hard to get money. And one, as we always say, don't work harder, work smarter. So why would I try to infect thousands of users to get access to credit cards when I can infect only one machines and even get more number of credit cards in. One of the things is infecting point of sales. So everyone now is paying using his credit card in the supermarket when he's buying clothes, when he's buying electronic stuff. But did we ever thought about the security of these machines? Some of these machines are already connected to the internet. If an attacker can infect it, guess what? He can get access to all our information, your credit card details, and he can make, it, can make use of it to steal a lot of money from you. Another type of attack, another way a criminal can make money is what we call ransomwares. So what are ransomwares? Ransomwares are a type of malware that will block your access to your machines and your files and ask you to pay a ransom before you are able to get access to this information. Guess that you are a student and you have to deliver a paper tomorrow or you are doing a research or a project that needs to be delivered tomorrow. And by night, one you are opening your PC, you find that all your files are encrypted. And then you are asked to pay a ransom to get back these files. What are you going to do? You don't have an option. You'll have to pay for it. You don't have an option. And that's what we are seeing as numbers. In Kaspersky Lab, we, we have more than 400 endpoints using our solutions. That means we have statistics and number about attacks. One of the most interesting numbers is that shows that ransomware is very successful for cyber criminals, is that the number of attacks using ransomware have been twice the number we have seen in 2016. In Q1 2017, we have seen 6 million attacks using ransomware, which is compared to 3 million in 2016. That's double the time. That's double the number. Only in the Middle East, we have seen more than 150,000 attacks using ransomware. That how it looks like. It might be as easy as that it will be just a dummy screen telling you that you have been accessing wrong websites and your computer was blocked until you pay the ransom and get back access to it. But that's the easy part. The more advanced, the most popular is it will be encrypting your file using asymmetric keys. And the only way for you to get the key back and the file is to pay the ransom. But again, as we always say, cyber criminals is working smarter, not harder. So instead of having to infect different types of entities and waiting for them to pay the ransom, they are starting to choose the right victim. So if I know that a hospital can be infected with a ransomware, can you imagine that you have a patient, those patients are going for a surgery or operation, and you are losing the information about them? What are the medicines they should be taking? What are their case where they're um, labs are, what are the numbers for them, what are you going to do? You don't have an option. You'll have to pay the ransom. That's what we are saying. They are clever. They are smart. They, before understanding the technical stuff, they understand the 
social stuff and uh, how we sing and what are the, our needs. One other thing, funny stuff, is that they are targeting hotel rooms. We have seen a sample of a ransomware attack where it targeted hotels in USA. They encrypted the keys for the hotel rooms. And guess what? All the people inside the hotel, they don't have access to their rooms. They are locked outside it, and they want to get their keys back. And they are lining up in front of the reception trying to get access to their rooms. So what are you going to do? You'll have to pay the ransom. You don't have other options. So, as we said, in Kaspersky Lab, we don't only believe that our goal is to protect our users. We work hard to improve our products and to make sure that technically we can detect and prevent attacks, but we also think that we need to help everyone in society, everyone who is using the internet. And guess what? Ransomware is one of the threats we have been alerting of for years. We think there is a big tragedy before, behind ransomware. So I told, for example, for you as a student, if you are using your files before a days before your exam, that's a tragedy. But let me tell you a story about some tragic stories that we have been told. Like there was a family and their small child was diagnosed for having cancer. And the doctor said that he's gonna die within three or four years. So what the family did is they started to try as much as they can to enjoy the last days of their child. They tried to travel everywhere, have pictures, enjoy their life. And then suddenly, they got the message from the ransomware, all your pictures, all your files was, infected, was encrypted, and you don't have access to it. And they reached out to our team crying for it. So that was our last days with our child. That was all our memories. That's all what we have for him. And we are losing all this stuff. So that's something we were really sad about, and we were trying to do something for it. So one of the initiatives we have been working on in Kaspersky Lab is what we call No More Ransomware. We have been cooperating. We have been cooperating with law enforcement in different countries, Interpol, Europol, governments, police in every country to try to prevent ransomware. We are tracking criminals, we are trying to get infrastructures, we are trying to seize their CNCs, and we are trying to get files back to users. So Keep in mind that if one day, if you know someone was infected with a ransomware, try to go and check the website for no ransomware, you might find some useful tips on how to return your files. So, as we said, prevention is better than cure. So instead of thinking how I can get back my files if I'm infected of having to pay the ransom, I need to understand how to keep secure. Backup important data and files, so in case you lost them, you'll have a backup to get it back. Keep all your software updated to prevent being infected in the first days. Use an antivirus solution, make sure you'll not be getting infected. Don't open attachment and unknown files coming from unknown sources. So what else? What else can attackers get money from? Gaming, so now everyone is pay playing online games. You have coins, you have credit, People are paying a lot of money to have access to points to play online and to buy weapons or to buy player in FIFA. Who's playing FIFA in here? No one? Yeah? So take care of your coins. So we have been seeing a trend in criminals trying to target this platform. Trends who are trying to steal money from your online game. Trends to criminals trying to steal points from online accounts. One of the most popular accounts is called Steam Platform. That's a platform for playing online games. We have seen a lot of attacks trying to steal points from there. And guess what? You know, the Middle East, when it comes to gaming, we are the best also. One of the most popular infection for these malwares is in our region. Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Bahrain, UAE. We are the most popular when it comes to gaming stuff. So we have been speaking about malwares, what are their goals, how they work, what are they targeting, what the information they are looking for. But let's a little bit speak more about how they infect us. What are the delivery methods for a malware? Okay, so the main four points that attackers are using to infect us is 
social networks, we'll speak more about it, USB devices, emails, and exploits. Okay, phishing emails. We all get the spam emails and phishing emails that might look like this one. Payment accepted or a, a message from your bank or a message from your mobile provider trying to open an attachment and then you get infected and you've got malware installed. That might be very clear for some people. You might understand it and you might not get infected. But what about this one? This is a sample of an real emails I've been seeing of an attacker and cyber criminals from our region, local cyber attackers. And this type and level of social engineering is completely different. They are not sending spam email to everyone. They are writing dedicated emails directed to specific people. One example of a story was for a journalist. They were trying to infect a journalist in the region, a very known one, and they were not successful. So what they did, they started physically monitoring him, tracking where he's going, what he's doing, until one day he was doing a meeting with some human rights activist. A couple of hours after the meeting, they sent him an email. Based on our meeting today, please find attached our, my answer to your questions. And guess what? The attachment was a malware. He was getting infected, and this, his data was stolen. The same email was sent to the human rights activist. Based on our meeting today, please find attached some question I would like you to answer for me. That's another level of an attack. That's one, one other example. It was in Egypt after the revolution. There was a meeting for the head of the political parties in Egypt. And then after the meeting by one hour, everyone who was attending this meeting got an email. Please find attached the summary of our meeting. And they were able to infect what we are speaking, the most active political activists in Egypt, the head of the political parties, and they were able to access enormous amount of information. They have different ways, like for every country, for every type of user, they have a specific user account. So it doesn't even need to be very advanced technical stuff. If I would like to ask you, do you think this type of file is malicious? You got a BDF file, BDF file. Would you, like, would you open it, or do you think it might be a malicious file? I tried this with some IT stuff, some people even working for Kaspersky, and most of them would say, that's a BDF file, I would open this file, no worries. Actually, this is not a PDF file. So if you look closer, you'll find that this file is not a PDF. It's a screen server file. And screen servers are executable files. So what are they doing? It's a clever method which we call right, left, overwrite. We're just insert a special character in the name of the file. And instead of having the name looks like this, it will be flipped over. So instead of having shown as a screen server, it will be shown as a PDF file. Social networks, so that's another example. Some criminals would have a social network account that looks more legitimate than, an, uh, than even my own account. They will have pictures, they will join groups, they will interact over these groups, and they will be very active. And then when we, they want to target someone, they will find a link, like what are the groups you are accessing, then they will try to make more activity on the website, you will get familiar with them, you will get an ad request, and then they will start chatting with you. I know the, the resolution is not very good, but if you can read the chat message, so it, it's a girl speaking to the victim and is telling him, please find my pictures. What are your feedback? And he's telling, wow, that's very beautiful. And actually, we have seen this used multiple times here in our region. And at the end, the attachment was not a picture. It was an executable file. Okay. So you usually get this advice. Don't visit unknown websites, stay safe, only visit known websites. Don't go to bad websites because you will get infected. But actually the truth is that even if you are visiting well-known websites, there is a, still a very great probability that you might get infected. There is what we call malvertising. So for any website to make money, he need to make advertisements. That's what we see when you access any websites. You see the advertisement. So what what is the advertisements you are seeing on the website? So what's actually happening is that the website is hosting a place in his website where he is showing contents from a different website. <clears throat> so for an attacker, it might be as easy as you will go for him or for the agency who is doing the advertisement and say, I want to buy a place to advertise my products. And then instead of showing your products, you are hosting an exploits and infection for the users. <clears throat> So we have been speaking, as we said, about the motivations 
behind attacks, which was mainly cybercrime, making money. But what about the most scary stuff? So I can start saying what we always say, like the next war will be fought by technology, the next weapons are using technology, and all this stuff. <clears throat> but I would like not to speak. I would like just to show you some titles and headlines. So in 2005, 2008, there was a lot of news about the Iranian nuclear capabilities. There was a plan to have an airstrike against the Iranian nuclear stations, and then suddenly no one was hearing about it. <clears throat> Until in 2010, we figured out that instead of doing an airstrike against Iranian nuclear powers, there was what we, they used a cyber weapon. We called it Stuxnet. This weapon was able to infect the machines working on the nuclear power plants, and they were able to damage and sabotage it. So that's, what, that's how it started. Then a couple of years later, there was this news, Iranian cyber attack on New York Dam. So they figured out that Iranian hackers were able to hack into the controllers for a New York Dam. That means they were able to flood the whole city. They can open the gates for the dam and flood the whole city. But luckily the dam was in maintenance and the automatic controller was disconnected. So it was only luck who was prevented a big disaster. Another example. Ukraine power cut was by cyber attack. So they took off the whole city of Ukraine using a cyber attack. It was dark, no one got access to electricity. It was a huge disaster. So that was not only the examples. We have different examples. One of these examples, the most scary thing I think, was South Korean hackers, who, North Korean hackers who were able to hack into a water treatment plant in South Korea. And they were able, if they want, to tamper with the chemicals that are used to treat water. What does that mean? That means they can make the water we are treating poison. That means they can kill millions of lives. That's what we are speaking about. That's the level we can reach with cyber attacks. That's how scary it can reach. OK, so we have been speaking about the current status, the current attacks. What about the future? What are the trends? What are the new things we might be seeing? One of the most trending stuff is smart cars, connected cars. <coughs> you can know information about your car remotely. You can control the car remotely. This is becoming very popular. A lot of vendors are competing to be very quick with providing this functionality and being able to provide this before the others. But no one is thinking about security. <coughs> and actually, like one and a half years ago, two security researchers have done something very important. They have made, they were able to hack into a Jeb Shuruki car, and they have made a great video that illustrates how scary this can reach. They asked one of their friend journalists to come visit them using his car, and they asked him to record his trip. And then funny stuff started going, going while he's on trip. Let's play the video and see how it works. Let's go for the next slide. Can we play the video? I don't think there is voice, but the guy here is, he is going for them, and then suddenly things, strange things start happening. He starts hearing music he is not playing, they start playing with his radio, and then they start playing the, so he was not able to see the, what, what is in front of him. Okay. We are still in the previous stage, then what else they can do? They start playing with the pricks, so suddenly pricks is being pushed without his doing anything. Then they killed the engine. So imagine you are on a highway and suddenly your car has been stopped. So that's very scary. The point here is that, as I said, vendors are rushing into providing functionality. But they are not responsible enough to think about security in advance. And that's the role of us. That's the role of the community, for the government to push for roles, to push for regulations, to make sure that before you provide a functionality, you are fully aware about the risk and the threats coming behind it. What else? Drones. Drones, might, for some people, this might sound like technology from the future. But actually, if you are reading the news, you'll find that in Dubai, they have a plan to use drones by the end of this year to be monitoring the whole city. The whole city of Dubai will be monitored using drones. So 
what are the risks that can come from this? Can you imagine that someone is taking over the drones and then crashing it to a crowd of people? There was at least three cases this year where the air flights in Dubai airport was put to stop because there were some drones getting close to a pilot to the airport. That's another risk we need to take in mind. Can you imagine someone can tamper with GPS locations and directing the drones to different ways and different locations? Okay, Internet of Things. We, has, we all have now smart watches, smart devices, smart refrigerators, smart routers. But do we think about the security of these devices? If they got hacked, what the information would be accessed, what the damage that could be caused by these devices? That's something we need to keep in mind. For example, like if you think that like instead of having a ransomware that's encrypting your files, you have a ransomware that's telling you that you pay me a ransom or I'll let one, everyone know how. What else? Cryptocurrencies. Who is here doing Bitcoin stuff? So now we see people are trending into using cryptocurrencies. People are buying cryptocurrencies and they still don't understand the threat behind it. Cryptocurrencies can be kept on your PC as a wallet. And if someone is infecting your PC, he can steal this money using a malware. What else? Like, criminals need miners to crypt mine out of the cryptocurrencies. So they will be infecting your machine to use the computation power to mine out currencies from your PC. Banks and financial sector are starting to use cryptocurrencies in their daily work. And we still don't know what could be the threat like. If someone can get access to the electronic wallet and transfer money without being able to track who is doing these transactions. That's another level that we need to keep in mind. So, in summary, as I have been saying, threats are everywhere. Threats are in mobile, threats are in our PC, threats are in the networks. We have exploits, we have malwares, we have threats to our smart cars, we have threats to our connected devices. There is a lot of threats. Criminals are working hard, criminals are working smart, criminals have motivations, criminals have capabilities and have funding. But the good news, but the good news is that Together we can build our shield wall. As Ragnar Rothbard said, shield wall. Together we can work harder to protect against all these attacks and to be side by side fighting cyber criminals, making sure that we are ready enough to face these attacks. Thank you.